Tonight, I want to talk about one of the wisest men that ever lived. His name was Solomon. And Solomon was extremely wise, and he was known to be one of the wisest men of all time. And he had some sons, and he wrote some advice to his sons we call the book of Proverbs. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to read Psalms chapter 7, some passages out of 7, and chapter 31. And I want to challenge you in the type of woman that I want you guys to really be dating and one day married to. But in order to do that, I first want to tell you about a story. A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to fly up to Gettysburg with a bunch of different guys and um, do kind of a Gettysburg leadership conference. And for three days, all we did was walk the battlefield. And we had this older guy who really knew his history. He kind of walked us through the entire battle of Gettysburg. And I don't know if you guys, you probably know this. But we got to do Pickett's Charge the last day, so I got to start. There's the Mississippi Graves, which would have been you guys in 1863. You've know, got the Mississippi Monument, the Louisiana Monument, the Alabama Monument. that are back in the woods where the Pickett's Charge started, where they would walk a mile into literally just blizzarding fire. The Union soldiers uh, had the high ground, which I'll talk about in a minute. They even had cannons. I didn't know this. They would hold these canisters, which each canister would have like 50 lead balls. And they could put three canisters in a cannon at a time, and they would just shoot them right into our ranks. And you guys, you, you have your own Mississippi, 11th Mississippi monument that's dedicated just to you guys. And we walked from that, they, they guesstimate, like I said, it took about 29 minutes. And we got all the <coughs> way literally to the wall. There were 393 of you all that made the charge, and 350 of you all were killed or wounded. Uh, and the rest probably died of wounds the next few days. But the way we got into that situation, that was July 3rd. The reason we got into that situation is because July 1st, we should have taken the high ground. Um, on the morning of July 1st, we attacked uh, the Union positions in Gettysburg from the north with 20,000 Confederate soldiers. And we were coming around with another 20,000 in the east. And we overwhelmed the Union soldiers early on, so much more that we completely pushed them out of the town of Gettysburg and up over, it's called Cemetery Hill, and down the back of the hill. And the, the Union generals were literally running down the back of the hill, trying to get their troops back together and say, we've got to get back up to that high, that high mountain, that high place. All right, now, let's go to the Confederate side. The Confederates, if we had taken the town, we were on the, on the edge of literally watching Cemetery Ridge, and supposedly what happened is, probably one of the, I think, one of the biggest decisions of the Civil War is General Yule saw the high ground, but he did nothing. General Trimble came up to him and he said, sir, give me a division and I will take that high hill. We have got to take the high ground. You see, there was a principle within um, soldiers and leaders is there's a preferred future and there's a probable future. The preferred future for the Union Army and the Confederate Army was to take the high ground. We've got to take the high ground. If we have the high ground, we're going to win the battle. But the probable future is if General Ewell did not move and he did not act, most likely during the course of the night, the Union Army would re, uh, reinforce themselves, which they did in mass, and they would have the high ground. Supposedly, General Trimble, he tried to get out from underneath General Ewell's leadership after this because he said, give me a division and I'll take the, the high hill. And he said nothing. He said, give me a company and I will take that, that, that hill. And General Trimble hesitated. And he did not act. And sure enough, during the evening, we reinforced this whole ridge. And for the next two days, we would lose, I think, over 15,000 men trying to take that ridge. And tonight, I'm going to talk to you about a preferred future and a probable future. And the preferred future I'm going to tell you about is, first of all, what type of woman do you ultimately want to end up with? And if you don't listen to what I'm talking about, because the things that I'm going to say are countercultural. The things I'm going to talk about, your, most of your friends don't talk about these things. Um, when you're out of the bars, people don't talk about these things. And a lot of times, sitting around the table, guys don't talk about some of the stuff that I'm talking about tonight. And if you don't listen to what I say, the probable future for you will be a really good chance that you'll be divorced and somebody else will be raising your kids. Or worse, I'm going to tell you about some pretty bad scenarios in this community. It's like I said, I've been here 18 years. So in order to start out, um, I've asked Buckner, our beloved president, to read us a, some scripture. And... Butter, if you could start in Proverbs chapter 7, here's what we want to do. We want to compare and contrast the Proverbs 7 woman with the Proverbs 31 woman, okay? I want to give you some advice. See me as a friend, as an older active, as a father figure, you know, like whatever you want. But see me as somebody who cares about you, 
I'm not paid to be here, okay? I'm here because I care about you guys, and I want to show these, these examples to you. So let's talk about that. So um, I've got a few verses deleted because I wanted to move for sake of time. But Butler, could you start in verse 1 and just start reading for us? Follow my advice, my son. Always treasure my commands. Obey my commands and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eyes. Tie them on your fingers as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Love wisdom like a sister. Make insight of the loved member of your family. Let them protect you from an affair with an immoral woman, from listening to the flattery of a promiscuous woman. Okay, real quick. So his intro, Solomon has said to his sons, listen to what I'm about to say, write it down, take notes. You do not want to end up with this type of woman. Okay? All right. Can you continue on, mate? While I was at the window of my house, looking through the curtain, I saw some naive young men, and one in particular who lacked common sense. He was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman, strolling down the path by our house. It was at twilight in the evening as deep darkness fell. The woman approached him, seductively dressed in sly heart. She was the brash, rebellious type, never content to stay at home. She is often in the streets and markets soliciting at every corner. She threw her arms around him and kissed him, and with a brazen look she said, You're the one I was looking for. I came out to find you and you are here. My bed is spread with beautiful blankets with colored sheets of, sheets of Egyptian linen. I perfume my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink our fill of love until morning. Let's enjoy each other's caresses. For my husband is not at home. He's, he's away on a long trip. He has taken a wallet full of money with him and won't return until later this month. So she seduced him with a pretty speech and enticed him with a flattery. He followed her at once like an ox going to the slaughter. He was like a stag caught in a, tra in a trap, awaiting the arrow that would pierce its heart. He was like a bird flying into a snare, little knowing it would cost him his life. So listen to me, my sons, and pay attention to my words. Don't let your heart stray away toward her. Don't wander down her wayward path, for she has been the ruin of many. Many men have been her victims. Her house is the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. Right. Thanks. Okay, let's make some observations about this, this story, okay? This type of story is a dime a dozen on the Ole Miss campus. First of all, Solomon, where is he watching this whole scenario take place? Where did he say? From his window, okay? He's in his castle or his palace. He's looking through the window, and he sees a naive young man, okay? What does the naive young man do? What is he out looking for? Somebody just said, what do you think? What's he out looking for? Sex. Sex. He's looking, he's looking, he's going looking for it, okay? He's thinking, I'll find it. And he goes close to the lady's home, so she knows he knows about where she is. And then when she comes out, what does she say to him? Yeah, you're the one I've been looking for. All right, she kisses him. Man, we love to be pursued. We love, we love respect. That's one of the biggest things. We want a woman that will respect us, that will come in and say, I've been looking for you. I want you, okay? That's attractive. That, that, that draws our emotions out, okay? But the problem with this woman is, where's her husband? She's married, it says. Where's her husband? He's out of town. He's on a long trip, right? He's got a big wallet of money. He won't be back for a while. Guys, these types of women are a dime a dozen. And you think right now in your life, oh, I'll, I'll look up with these types of women. I'll have these types of women. But one day I'll be slow down and I'll meet the girl we're going to talk about in a minute and I'll live happily ever after. And guys, it just does not happen like that. Okay? I can tell you because I'm, I'm way over twice your age, but I've lived in this community for 18 <laughs> years. And I'm going to tell you some things about this community in a minute. Because this community, I guarantee you, is just like Auburn where I lived for four years. And just like Fayetteville where I was for four years and then growing up in Little Rock. It's just now these men, what, what happens is that when you live like this, what happens, well, look at the, the okay, so the man, he may have been y'all's age one time, the man that's now married and on a long trip, and he thought it'd be great to hook up with a girl like this. And what happens is the type of girls like this that you date, you end up marrying a girl like this. Now, can you trust or respect this girl? No, because look what she's doing now. She's cheating on her husband. She's going out soliciting other men. And guys, this, this campus is full of insecure women, desperate women. My senior year in high school, my, one of my best friends was drinking and driving and got killed in a car wreck. 
And I really got mad at God. And I just kind of rebelled from God. And I started drinking way too much and hooking up with girls and doing things that I would re re regret later. But my freshman year, as a pledge, like you guys, I made a decision that I was going to start living right. That I was going to change my lifestyle. And two different nights, one of those girls, she ended up going to Arkansas too, that I used to hook up with, and she pledged a sorority. And there's two different nights she got drunk and came to my room. And I knew, she, and I lived in the fraternity house, and she came at night, and I knew what she was going to do. And I, I opened the door, let her come in, talked to her for a little bit, and I said, hey, tomorrow I've got a big day, I'm really busy. And I, I withstand, withheld myself and just kind of let her, let her go. And guys, you've got to make a decision. What type of man are you going to be right now? What type of decisions are you going to make? But these, these types of girls, they will destroy your life. When you get in your 20s and your 30s, you will really look back with remorse and shame about the decisions you made. And like I told you a couple weeks ago, you won't remember the names of the girls you did things with, but you'll remember everything you did. And you'll never look back and say, I wish I'd have done more with so-and-so. I wish I'd have hooked up with so-and-so more, if you want a good marriage. If you want a good marriage one day, and you want a wife that you can love and trust, and like I, I, I may have shared with you guys a couple weeks ago, I heard a guy say that he had had sex with so many girls that he couldn't even keep his eyes uh, he had to keep his eyes open the first year of his marriage because he just kept remembering all these women. You see, when you're married, guys, you don't want to remember those women. You don't want to think back of that. So I'm trying to give you advice now to spare you from being in your late 20s, your 30s, and having your second or third marriage. I want to look at a case example really quick. And um, Hunter, could you read the next passage here? Um, Solomon was wise, y'all. One reason he was wise is because he knows what happened to his dad. His dad, David, made some bad mistakes. And would you read just the first, I mean, I've just got the first six verses of 2 Samuel 11, and we're going to talk, this is a case in point study of making bad choices, and I'm going to tell you how much it costs David in a minute. Hunter, go ahead. In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Re Re uh, Rabbah. Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah, Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent a messenger to get her. She came to him and slept, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceded and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. Okay, so in the spring, when the time the kings go out to battle, what did David do? <coughs> Stay back. He stayed home. He stayed back. And you notice the language. It's really interesting. It said, in the evening, David got out of bed. In other words, David was being lazy. He was laying around the palace. He wouldn't do anything. In the evening, he also knew what he could do. And that he, he knew out, up above the palace, in a certain place, in the certain evenings, the women would come out and bathe in the cool of the evening. And he knew where the women bathed. And when he watched, he saw a woman, he found out who she was, then he had her sent and brought to him. He didn't have to worry about her husband because her husband was out fighting his battles that he should have been battling. And he, he forces her to have sex with him, and she gets pregnant. What does she do? She sends word to him and says, hey, I'm sorry, I'm pregnant. So what does he do? The rest of the story is he sends off to the battle and has Uriah brought back to him. And he tells you, one night he has this big party for Uriah. He gets Uriah drunk and he says, Uriah, you're doing a great job. Go, go sleep with your wife. Because he's trying to cover up his tracks. Because back then they didn't have any DNA samples, you know. So, so Uriah is such a faithful soldier, he sleeps on the front porch of his house. Because he knows his fellow peer soldiers are out fighting the battle. Well, of course, the word gets back to David. So David has Uriah come over the next night and says, come on, man, let's drink again. Gets him drunk again and says, go sleep with your wife. And he goes and sleeps on the front porch again. The, this is one of those decisions that goes from bad to worse to really, really worse. So he writes a letter, and he sends it with Uriah to the front lines, and he says, when you fight the enemy, at the moment it gets fierce, have the men on either side of Uriah back up. So Uriah's not going to back up. He's obviously a great soldier. So when he's fighting, they have the men back up, and Uriah was killed. Well, word comes to David. David's like, yes, okay, he's dead. So he has Bathsheba come and brought to be his wife. So he's, he's basically committed forced 
sex. He's lied, he's been deceptive, and now he's murdered her husband. And two years go by, most men believe, I mean, most commentators, and one day a prophet came to his, his uh, house and said, hey, can I have a few words with you? And he said, yeah. He said, listen, there's this man who's really wealthy. He's got all the sheep he wants. And he went down the street to this really poor man's house, and he only has one sheep. And he took his six sheep, and he slaughtered it at his party. And he, and he took that old man's sheep and had a party with it. What should he done to that man? And David said, that man deserves to die. Take four, fourfold from that man and give it to the poor man. And Nathan the prophet said, you're the man. You did that to Uriah the Hittite. You took his wife, and you killed him, and you took her to your own. Because God sees in secret. We may do things in secret, but God sees in secret. And David ended up losing that kid, losing another kid. <clears throat> Absalom took over his kingdom, and then he had to have Absalom killed, and he lost another kid. He, he said fourfold should be taken and given to that guy. He actually, he actually lost four of his kids. Um, General, um, Hall, I think it's General, I believe it's Hill. General Hill, on the day we started the battle, needed to be in Gettysburg fighting the battle, but he hooked up with a girl in college and was uh, suffering from syphilis. So he couldn't even, when he needed to be at the right place to be a general and be needed to, to, to command and to call the troops, he couldn't even be there because of uh, the decision he had made back in college. Guys, I want to spare you from those types of decisions. I want you to plan it down and think about what type of girl do I want to end up with. Flip over and let's talk for a few minutes about that type of girl. Proverbs 31, woman. I'll read this, okay? Verse 1 says, and I'm going to obviously leave some verses out for the sake of time, but it says, Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her. He said, uh, let's see. Her husband can trust her, and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She gets up before dawn and prepares breakfast for her household and plans the day's work for her serving girls. She goes to inspect a field, and she buys it. With her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She's energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread. Her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her own bedspreads. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known in the city gates, where he sits with the other civic leaders. All right, I want to stop there for just a minute. What are some of the qualities, some of you guys yell out, some of the qualities about this woman so far? Hard work, hard work. Okay, she's hardworking. Exactly. Guys, you need a woman that you can trust. A woman that respects you and you can trust her. Because if you're going to be successful in business, you're going to be at the office a lot. And what is your wife going to do when you're not around? You need a woman that you can trust, that you can respect. But my question is, are you that type of man that deserves that type of woman? Because see, her husband is respected and he's seen at the gates. Who were the most respected men in the community back then? They were the men that were at the gates. They were the leaders of the community. The gates to the, to the wall of fortified cities. That's where the leaders were. You see, her husband was respected and trusted in the community. Are you guys being that type of person? What I challenge you to do as an application of what we're talking about tonight is get a sheet of paper when you're alone sometime and write down the type of qualities that you want in a woman. So hopefully some of these qualities we're talking about is what you want in a woman. Then I want you to ask yourself, what do I need to be doing in my life to prepare me to get that type of woman? Because I believe in God, and if I'm God, I'm going to give you what you deserve. And if I've got this great girl here that's, that's, ch that's cherishing me and that's walking in my statutes and she's a great girl, I'm going to give her a man that I know will take care of her. Okay, I love my daughter. She's 13 years old. And I'm definitely going to make sure the man she marries is a man who I can respect and trust and, and literally have my daughter go to that man. All right, let's go to this next passage. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise. She gives instruction and kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household, and she suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. He says, there are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. And then a key verse, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, or it will not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. 
Guys, the girl we talked about a while ago says that when you go to a girl like that, you're like a stag caught in a trap, and you do not know that it will pierce your liver or your stomach, and you will die. I asked my wife one time, I was like, why do some of the translations, she was pre-med, I was like, why do some of the translations say you, you, this, woman, this type of woman will pierce your liver? Because in war, if I had a sword and I could get you in the liver, your liver, when it gets pierced, it poisons your whole body and it kills you. You see, the, piece, piece, the Proverbs 7 woman, she kills you. Okay, she stains you. She, she crushes your life and your future. The Proverbs 31 woman, guys, that's the girl you need. That's the girl you need to wait on. When my sister graduated from Arkansas, she became a missionary to Honduras and worked in an orphanage. And I would have thought, that's the worst place for her to meet a husband. That's in the middle of nowhere in a third world country. But because my sister was more concerned about character and integrity and serving others, she worked with orphan kids, there was a godly man from Arkansas, that, I mean, I'm sorry, from California, that began to dedicate his time and fly into Honduras, and I ended up performing their wedding. So I would rather you wait on the right girl so that you can have a marriage that makes it. Look at these few verses right here. Okay, you don't want to end up with a woman like this. I dated a girl like this in Arkansas for a little bit. Um, yeah, she was beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, she loved to argue. And it says here, a beautiful woman who lacks discretion is like a gold ring in a pig's snout. A quarrelsome wife is as annoying as a constant dripping on a rainy day. It's better to live alone in the corner of your attic, in the middle of your attic, think about it, the corner of your attic, I mean, or some translations say on your roof, than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. Guys, think about the type of girl you're, you're dating, the type of girl you're spending time with. Is she sweet? Is she kind? Does she give herself to others? Can you trust her when you're, when you're not around? That's the type of girl you want to marry. But let me be really honest with you. Um, my wife and I were talking recently, uh, this is actually two years ago, and I told her that I didn't know that there was really a growing number of women that masturbate today. And I didn't know that women are starting to look at porn and masturbate more. And I was talking about it with my wife, and she said, well, to be honest, Isaac, she goes, you're not going to believe this, but she said, she said, the other day, I was talking to a married woman in the community, and she told me that she was hanging out with some married women in Oxford community, okay? There was five of them, and they got together one night. And these women were probably in their late 30s, married with a couple kids, and they started talking, and they, they began to admit to each other that four out of the five regularly uh, basically had sex with herself and looked at porn, Okay, so I'm thinking, so I was just cringing talking to my wife about it. So I'm like, well, where are, where are the husbands? This is Oxford. Some, some of these girls, these ladies lived in Wellsgate. And I'm like, where are their husbands? And well, we found out two of the husbands were very verbally abusive. They didn't treat their wives well. One of those couples is already divorced. One of those women got drunk from a square one night, and a friend of mine gave her a ride home, and she said, I'll give you money. Would you please have sex with me? She told, she told my friend, I haven't had sex in two years. Okay, so do any of you guys, uh, would any of you ever come to me and say, hey, Isaac, here's the deal. I'm getting married pretty soon. We're going to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on marriage. And here's what I'm thinking. This, I think this is going to be a great idea. In about five to ten years, I'm just going to be looking at porn and having sex with myself. My wife's going to be having, looking at porn and having sex with herself. And maybe every once in a while we'll have sex. Okay, none of you guys want to be there. That sounds really Weird to me. That sounds really dysfunctional, okay? But there's four out of five women in this community. That's where they live. That's how they live their lives. So, guys, you need to understand, do the movies care about you? No. Do the music you listen to, does it care about you? No. I care about you. I want you to have a good marriage. But the decisions you make now, they're going to follow you. Okay, guys? Are you guys tracking with me? <coughs> My desire, to be honest, as I've said before, is I want to scare the hell out of you so that you'll say, I don't want to be that guy. That guy who's talking about the, the dude in the passage on Proverbs 7, I don't want to be that guy. And I'm going to do what it takes not to be that guy. I've said this before, guys. I believe only about 5% of the men who live in Oxford get good sex on a regular basis and have a good marriage. Because over half of you guys are going to get divorced. And then another big percentage of you, your wives, you're not going to have sex with your wives because you're not going to treat them with respect. So they're not going to want to give you what you need or what you desire. You guys, try to be that 5%. Try to be the ones who have a good marriage. In light of that, let me pray for you, okay? Lord, I know that um, Father, these things are heavy that I talk about. These are the things that we don't ever talk about. I've never really heard a pastor ever even speak on these things and be so honest about these things. But Lord, it is the reality in which we live in. 
these women that I talked about a while ago, they were probably sorority girls here at Ole Miss 15 or 20 years ago. And Lord, I don't want these men to end up like that. Father, I pray that you would give them wisdom to treat women with respect, that they would honor women, that they would cherish and protect the women that they're dating. Father, that they would honor these women and take them home more holier and honored than before they pick them up. Lord, I pray that I would bump into many of these men 5, 10, 15 years down the road and they would say, I've got a great marriage and I love my wife and she's the type of woman I want to be with for the rest of my life. Lord, I pray for wisdom, Father, and direction for these men in your name. Amen.